So in chapter five, we're going to look at information technology infrastructures, how, what are the components of the infrastru infrastructure for an organization, um, how do these components work for the organization, what are some of the emerging technologies and newer trends in infrastructures for organizations. So we're going to look at all of that stuff, things like cloud computing that we've, you probably have heard of, but maybe haven't really um, gotten enough detail about. Okay, so, so what is an infrastructure? Okay, an infrastructure is the physical devices as well as the software that's required for an organization, uh, an, an organization to work, to operate. Okay, so, um, and your infrastructure is the basis for an organization to provide services to, across the organization, firm-wide level services. Okay, and some of these services, they give you a small list of some of these services, things like um, telecommunications and data management services, application software, and we'll talk about you know, that, what those are, um, IT management, um, things like standards, education and training, research and development, all of those services that most organizations need um, to function. Okay? Um, and you can kind of think of um, this idea of a service platform, um, which is where you are you, you're looking at having um, viewing all of your technology as a whole as a set of you know this set of services that you're providing to your organization. Okay, so this is a visual that looks at the connection between your business strategy, and this is one of the hardest things for organizations to do, is to really connect to our, our overall strategy. What is it that we're trying to do? Are we a low-cost leader? Are we, um, are we dif uh, differentiating ourselves from our competition? And how do our investments in IT support that strategy? Okay, or it's easy for organizations to uh, invest in the newest, fastest, shiniest technology and to lose sight of their overall strategy. So if you're investing in technology that doesn't support your strategy, you're wasting money, really. Okay? So you are aware of your business strategy as well as your IT strategy, right? How, what technologies do you need to invest in to support that overall strategy? Where we want to be in five years, in ten years. Okay, and then of course the technology itself going into all of these pieces should go in and support your, in, your um, services and infrastructure and we're going to talk about that in more detail. And then of course providing different types of services across the organization, services to your customers, services to your suppliers, um, other enterprise level services. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the IT arc, um, infrastructure and the evolution of the infrastructure. When we talk about this, we're going to bring up some different types of technologies and we're going to talk about um, how these technologies were used and how they're all, actually every one of these different phases, um, types of technologies are still in use today, but the way they were used when they were first introduced versus now is, tends to be a little bit different. So. Starting in 1959, um, you had the mainframe um, era, okay? Mainframes are um, centralized computers where um, all of the resources and processing power is centralized in one place with sort of dumb client terminals that connect to that mainframe um, in order to use those services, okay? So you really had terminals that you would connect to, you'd have to connect to the main um, computer um, in order to do anything, okay? Because the, the, the small clients themselves didn't have any processing or resources, okay? Um, now, mainframes are still used today, but the way that they're used is a little bit different, okay? Um, they're used more so as servers um, and but the clients that they are supporting are not dumb clients anymore. They have their own level of processing. Okay, so you can have a sort of, um, when we talk about client server, you can have a sort of split of the processing between the client and the server um, without have, you know, having you know, the server itself have all of the, of the processing power. Okay, um, starting in 1981, we had the personal computer error began. 
Um, now, per PCs, personal computers, um, were basically compute, uh, you know, desktop level computers that have their own level of processing and resources that are available to them. 1981 was not really the first um, personal computers, but they were the first personal computers that were used on a widespread basis where businesses were actually investing in and utilizing um, uh, PCs, putting them on employees' desks, having them use word processing and Excel spread type of spreadsheets, things like that. Now, back in 81, these, these computers were not networked. Okay, so when we think about computers, we think about personal computers, one of the first things we think about is getting onto the internet, connecting with outside resources, right? Back in 81, that wasn't the way it was done. Okay, it was just introducing all of these applications that we take for granted now, word processing, uh, presentation, graphing, and, um, and other types of analysis software, things like that, okay? Um, the client server area really started in 83, um, and it was this idea of, and even here, you, you didn't necessarily have this kind of, it wasn't the internet client server, it was more um, having desktop clients that were connected to servers instead of mainframes, and the, again, they were splitting the processing between these two different devices, okay? And for a network, you can have a very simple network with one client connected to one server, Okay, um, or you can have multi-tiered um, multi uh, uh, networks where you have, um, instead of just one level, you have multi many levels. Okay, so this is just the different phases here. This is the mainframe computer, uh, mainframe mini computer where you have a um, centralized computing with these, these small dumb terminals that basically connect to and um, sort of compete for the resources on the mainframe. Um, you have the personal computer where instead of having everything centralized, all the processing as well as all of the resources on one computer and you're all sort of fighting for time, each one of these, the devices has its own level of processing and its own resources that can be utilized. Okay, and then client server, uh, which was really the basis for um, the internet um, the internet technology that we are very, um, you know, we're very um, uh, familiar with today, which is basically you have a server that create that that um, connects two clients, right? The clients are making a request from the server. So whenever you open up a computing device, your uh, your laptop, your iPad, your um, your cell phone. You open up a browser and you are connecting to Google or you're connecting to Facebook. You're making a request from your client device to a server, one of Google's many servers or one of Facebook's many servers. Okay. The enterprise computing error, okay, this was looking at starting to, and this started in 1992, and again, enterprise computing is not, is something that we continue to see today. Okay, so that's why it says 92 to the present. Um, this is a move by organizations from different disparate small networks to connecting all of those networks um, in a way that you could easily share information across an organization. So instead of having uh, sort of islands of information within an organization, you had a way to connect all of that together and more easily share data across the organization. Okay. Um, and then, of course, cloud computing, which um, really became popular and a buzzword to a certain extent in the year 2000 and moving forward. But cloud computing um, is where you have organizations that are obtaining some level of computer or processing power, storage, and other types of resources um, using the internet infrastructure, okay? And cloud computing, you're actually, you're able to access your resources anywhere that you can, you have a browser and an internet connection, okay? Um, you know, mobile devices have become um, very, you know, your, your smartphones are very small handheld computers. You know, you can do a lot of the things you, you needed a laptop or a desktop computer. You can do a lot of that stuff now on your, on your mobile devices. And companies are taking notice of that, realizing that 
their salespeople don't always have a laptop with them or don't always aren't able to pull that stuff out, but they always have their cell phone with them. Right? So they're able to, you know, to, to do things on these smaller devices. Okay. So this is, you know, this idea of enterprise enterprise computing, again, where you have these smaller networks that you are able to connect across the organization so that you could share data across the organization. And then of course cloud computing. Right? And um, you know, some examples of cloud computing include things like Google, uh, a lot of Google applications like Google Docs and, and their um, email. Um, Salesforce.com has, um, has, uh, has applications to support organizations, um, Salesforce, customer relationship management applications, things like that. And, they're, and it's all available using the internet. This is an example of a multi-tiered client server. Again, you have a client that is connecting to, connecting through the internet um, to a web server, which connects to an application server. Right? This is what they mean by multi-tiered, where you have different levels of, um, of resources available to you. Um, and after that, again, connecting to an application that connects to a database. And, in chapter six, we'll talk in more detail about about databases and um, and ways of um, of uh, getting business intelligence out of out of um, databases. Okay, so some of the drivers of this evolution, right? We've seen we've taken a look at this infrastructure evolution. We've looked at these five different phases. Um, what are some of the drivers that are moving this evolution forward? Okay, Moore's law, Gordon Moore. Um, Gordon Moore is one of the, t the founders of the of Intel. Okay, in '65, I think they said. 1965. Does it say '65? '65. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, wrote a paper that basically said every. Now the way that that it's been framed in many different ways, but about every year, um, the number of components on a chip is doubled every year. Okay, so you have a single microchip and the number of components that you can put on it, the number of transistors um, that you can put on it should double about every year. This was back in 65 and that is actually held up, um, you know, almost, um, you know, almost 60 years later, almost 60 years later, right? Um, and there's really no, no view to, it's actually... It's, he said 12 months, but it's closer to about 18 to 24 months, but it still holds up pretty true, right? And one of the technologies that has made it so that this, you're able to, um, to double the amount of transistors on a single chip is nanotechnology, okay? Um, and nanotechnology is where you're looking at transistors at a, an atom and um, molecule scale, okay? So instead of thinking about um, with nanotechnology we're able to fit even more transistors which makes the processing power of those chips even um, you know even more uh, makes them even more powerful and, and is one of the reasons why we have such smart mobile devices because you're able to get more and more um, chips more and more transistors onto smaller and smaller chips okay Another driver for the infrastructure evolution is this idea of the, the law of mass digital storage. Um, along with all of this processing power get, um, doubling year, year in and year out, we also, if you, um, it, we also have storage prices going down over time. Okay, so you, you may have seen this as a consumer looking at things like flash drives, right? Um, Anybody have a flash drive with them right now? What's the si what's the size of your flash drive? I don't know. I think sixteen gigs. Sixteen gigs, yeah. right? Um, sixteen gigs, and it probably costs you twenty bucks, maybe a little more than that, right? Um, <laughs> uh, in the next, you know, twenty years, you're probably going to be able to carry, you know, like a terabyte of of data on a flash drive. Right, just because um, the 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 advances in um, in storage technology make it so we can store more and more on smaller and smaller devices, okay? Um, and a um, a gigabyte is one thousand twenty four um, kilobytes, 
Um, I know, any of you guys remember floppy disks? Right? A floppy disk is like 1.4 megabytes, right? So <laughs> um, really, 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 really small um, as compared to, you know, your, your 16 gig or even your 1 gig flash drive, right? So we see that as consumers, we can see that when you're, when you're, when you're um, in the market for a new computer, right, you'll notice that hard drive space has gotten to be much larger. Um, the typical desktop um, hard drive space is somewhere around 500 gigs to about a terabyte, depending on the, the, how much you want to spend and the, and the, the device itself. Okay. But as consumers, we see these, the, these changes, but for organizations, this means that it's cheaper and cheaper for them to store more and more data, for them to keep information about customers, to keep information about transactions, and to store that data for longer and longer times, to have um, long, uh, longitudinal type of data that they can do things like data mine. Right to find um, interesting patterns. We'll talk about that more in chapter six. But it makes it so that that those types of analyses are possible. Okay. So here, this is, just kind of gives you a visual way of looking at Moore's law and thinking about Moore's law, where you know in 1970, right? Um, just talking about the amount of processing power and how it has increased. And processing power for a computer is measured in the number of instructions per second. Uh, actually, it's now in millions of, of instructions per second. Okay, so here in 2010, which was two years ago, right? Um, you're looking at um, the the number of the processing power, the um, millions of instructions per second. It, these numbers are weird. It says 500,000 up here, but it actually says 15, 1,500. But that's millions of instructions per second. So it's actually somewhere around 500 trillion instructions per second for the, the typical, um, you know, the typical, the typical processing power that we can get. I think it's per dollar, okay. And then, of course, the falling cost of chips over time, because of these um, advances in technology, in nanotechnology, we can get more and more transistors on, um, on smaller spaces on, on, um, on chips, okay. This looks, uh, looks at some of the different shapes of the nanotechnologies that we talked about, the technology where we're looking at, um, we're looking, um, at transistors at an atomic level. They're so small. Okay. And then, of course, looking at the data on um, storage and how it's declined over time. It's, and it's an exponential decline. The amount of kilobytes that you can get per dollar goes up exponentially year in and year out, okay? So again, more storage for less money, more processing power for less money, is, is, those are two of the drivers that go hand in hand for the different, the, um, the infrastructure changes that we see and the technological changes that we see, okay? Some of the other drivers of this evolution, uh, Metcalfe's law, um, With, um, Metcalfe's law looks at network economics, and it's the idea that um, at the more um, the more members you have of a particular network, um, the more valuable that network is to its to its members. Okay, so you kind of think about um, you can think about this in um, in terms of like social networks, right? That's a network, uh, you know. Um, Five years ago, um, maybe a little over five years, probably closer to ten years, MySpace was a social network to be on, right? Nowadays, it's Facebook, okay? Um, and again, it's one of those things where I, I was on Facebook before my husband was on Facebook, and I remember trying to convince him to go on to Facebook, and he was like, everybody I know is on MySpace. Why am I going to go on Facebook? You know, if everybody that you know and that you want to interact with is on one social network, you're going to be reluctant to move to a different one where there's going to be less people. Uh, Google Plus has that issue right now. Opening Google Plus is another social network. That's Google's, you know, Facebook. Um, and it doesn't have a lot, you know, I, I don't have a lot of friends from Facebook that have made the jump over to Google Plus, so I'm on there, but it's not as interesting for me to, to be in that, that network because there's not a lot of people that I know, okay? 
So you can kind of think about that, but um, I, and that type, we can think about this, this network economics in terms of things like the internet, right? The more members you have of a particular network, the more value that network has for you. You also have declining communication costs. Uh, broadband, com broadband internet is a, a lot more affordable than it used to be, right? What's, um, what are some of the different ways that residentially you can connect to the internet? Wi-Fi. Huh? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, right? And what, uh, so that would be any kind of wireless. What are some of the broadband connections, like the wired ones? How do you connect at home if you do? What's the technology that you use, or the, the company? Comcast. Time Warner, right? And what is Time Warner? It's a cable company, right? So you have the cable internet, right? Um, you have um, internet through uh, other telecommunications. I don't know, AT&T, I think, is um, it's digital, but I think it might be cable also. It is. Fios? Fios? Yeah, yeah Fios. I was... When I moved a few years ago, I was so excited to find out that we had Fios in our area. <laughs> but Fios is, um, is, is Verizon's fiber optic, which is actually um, the current fastest residential connection that you can get. Um, but I remember connecting to the internet in the late 90s and finding that, um, you know, being unhappy because I actually, you know, I grew up in Bloomington over here. And Bloomington's not the most, if you're familiar with the area, it's not the most technologically edgy place in the world. Um, and so I remember trying to get um, some kind of broadband connection and I was stuck with, 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 uh, with um, dial-up for a long time. Uh, you know, and dial-up is the only type of connection that's called narrowband. Everything else is broadband, right? So, um, so the and I remember the price of trying to get any other type of broadband connection, like um, satellite. I was able to get satellite, but it was going to cost me back then. It was going to cost me about eighty dollars a month to get satellite, and it just was not in the cards. So I I, I slugged through with dial-up for a long time. Um, but the communication costs that are declining over time, right? It's much cheaper now to connect uh, to connect to a broadband connection um, residentially, as well as uh, you know free Wi-Fi, which is a trend that a lot of companies are moving toward, right? A lot of people just expect that in certain places you're going to be able to find a Wi-Fi signal, right? You go to school, you expect there should be a Wi-Fi signal you can jump onto. Uh, you may be in the in the airport. You 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 know kind of expect that there's going to be some kind of Wi-Fi that you can pass the time using, right? So um, these communications costs are dropping over time, making it so that um, connecting to the internet is something that is financially feasible for a lot more people. Okay. So again, you have these declines in internet communication costs moving toward zero, okay? Which once you know, once it gets to a certain point, you have an explosion in the amount of people that are um, connected to the internet. Okay. Some of the other drivers of this evolution include things like standards, okay? Um, without technology standards, we would not be able to communicate in any way. Um, the internet, does anybody know what the protocol or the standard for communication on the internet is called? It's TCP IP. Maybe, I don't know if that, that sounds familiar. Um, the tele, telecommunicate, I'm trying to remember. I know the IP is an internet protocol. <sighs> Telecommunications uh, protocol. Internet protocol. Proxy. Right. Telecommunications pro No, I don't think proxy's in it. <laughs> we cover it in chapter seven, I think. Control Transmission control protocol. Okay. I remember internet protocol. Okay. But that's the that's the standard for communication on the internet. If there was not a standard for communication, um, we would not be able to connect our devices to the internet to be able to download and upload resources, share information. Because of that standard, um, it makes it so that we can, you know, we can connect. Um, and standards 
um, are something that, and because there's a lot of times things like security. For internet security, there is no trusted standard out there. There are certain um, security um, technologies that um, are widely subscribed to that a lot of companies utilize, things like um, secure socket layer, um, encryption, stuff like that. But there's no standard. There's nothing out there that says if you're going to be on the internet, you're going to be a business on the internet engaged in e-commerce, you need to use A, B, and C. Okay? So, without standards, it, you know, you end up having competing um, technologies. Um, you can kind of think about some of the entertainment competitions that we've had. Um, what was the big, um, the big sort of rivalry in entertainment technologies back in the 80s? What were the two different technologies that were sort of battling it out for dominance? And when I say entertainment, um, movies, for uh, uh, hardware for movies. VCR, right? VHS. VHS and Beta. I don't know if you remember VHS and Beta, but they were two competing technologies. Um, and you, because there was no accepted standard, they had, you know, you had those two that were competing. And um, from what I know, uh, the Beta was actually the better technology, but it, it didn't win out because there were a lot of high financial backers for for VHS, particularly actually the adult movie industry, from what I know, back to VHS, and there was, there's a lot of money behind that industry, so that's actually how um, how VHS became the dominant um, technology of the two, right? There, there was a recent technological competition. Do you guys remember? Blu-ray, yeah, right? Blu-ray and HD, right? Uh, so that was, you know, it's the same type of thing, right? Two different technologies that are similar, um, you know, different components for each one, and you have, uh, you know, one that emerges as the, the victor, I guess, in the, in the two. Isn't Blu-ray HD? HD, what it was is there were two different pro proprietary technologies um, that were owned by different companies. So um, when they use actually the word the HD, the high definition is actually a very generic term, but at that time it actually stood for a particular technology, a proprietary technology that was um, a um, a competitor to Blu-ray. So yeah. Okay. So standards are really important when it comes to technologies. Because you have to have a way of communicating across these different networks, and standards enable that type of communication. Okay, so your any IT infrastructure has seven major components. Okay, it has hardware, computer hardware platforms, operating system platforms, enterprise software platforms, data management and storage, um, networking and communication platforms, internet platforms, and then consulting system integration types of services that all go together. Okay, and we're going to look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. Okay, but this is, looks at all seven of those pieces together and views them as an, this IT infrastructure ecosystem where all of these pieces have to be present and work together in order to have an infrastructure, an IT infrastructure. Okay, we're going to look at each one of these, but if you'll notice in this in this visual, it actually shows some of the technologies that are under each one of these areas. Okay. Um, so for your computer hardware platforms, you have your clients and your servers, and we've already talked about this idea of a client versus a server, right? Um, and this just talks about some of the different technologies under there. Mainframes, which are again, are still in use. Um, Operating system platforms, now, um, for server operating systems, most of the operating systems um, that um, are in personal computers have network-type
types of capabilities in them, right? That's the reason why you can connect your, your laptops and your other mobile devices to uh, wireless networks, create home networks, things like that. If you're doing, uh, if you need a more robust type of network, you need actual server software, actual operating system that is, um, that is built to, to support um, the activities of a, of a server, okay? Um, currently, server operating systems, about 75% of them are Windows-based machines. Um, 20, another 25%, the other 25% is either Linux or Unix. Um, Linux, uh, Unix is a, um, is a machine language that um, is actually, um, you don't have Unix a lot of times on personal devices, Linux was built upon Unix and is an open source um, operating system that you can find on machines. You can actually download different versions of Linux. Um, it's open source. Do you guys know what open source means? We've talked about open source before, right? Free, and you can freely get, a, get the code available online, right? So you can actually make changes to the code if you wanted to. Okay, for the clients, this is about 90% run Microsoft Windows. This is actually probably a little bit lower toward 85 or the low 80s, right? Because the, um, the uh, Macintosh operating system, their hardware and their, their software has made a resurgence. So there's a lot more people that are using uh, Macintosh computers, okay? Um, you have different hand, you know, operating systems for handheld devices. Um, Apple, Android, actually Android is the current um, market share leader. Um, there are, the latest statistics I saw um, said something about somewhere around 45 to 47% of the hand, of the mobile devices out there, smartphones are Android. Okay, uh, iPhone is somewhere around 30%, and then the other ones are things like uh, Palm and, uh, and Blackberry, okay. Um, cloud computing, you have cloud computing operating system. Google has a, its own operating system called Chrome that runs on netbooks. And the idea is that all of your resources are in the cloud um, using Google's um, infrastructure so that you don't have to have robust resources and processing power on the computer itself, the client, because everything is accessing those services and that information online using a, a, a cloud computing type of um, infrastructure, okay? You also have enterprise software applications, and enterprise software applications are, um, we'll talk more about these, but they're generally um, ERP types of systems, enterprise resource planning systems that connect all of the resources across an organization. ERP systems tend to be modular, so you can get pick and choose the different pieces that you want to include. Um, usually they have, as their core functions, have things like finance, um, HR, uh, and operations together, and you can add things like e-business and supply chain management, customer relationship management as, you know, as modular add-ons to that, okay? Middleware, middleware is um, software that connects systems together so that they can communicate and share data. A lot of organizations have uh, legacy systems, systems that are older, systems that still have data in them, and it's really expensive for, it would be really expensive for those companies to try to get all of that data out, but they still need access to it. So in order to get access to it, they use middleware to connect to those older systems, okay? We have data management and storage. You, you have different types of database software, and the types of database software that you use personally, things like Access, is a lot different from the types of, um, the types of so uh, software that organizations and enterprises, enterprise uses. So you have you know, Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, um, things like that. Yeah, physical data storage, you may have heard if, you've, if you have looked for external hard drives or have done any shopping for hard drives, you might recognize some of these, uh, these names, uh, particularly Western Digital um, has a lot of their own little um, external hard drives, but they're, they're uh, companies that are 
Um, there are competitors in the physical data storage, the actual hardware itself. Storage area networks. Storage, there's two different types of storage area networks. Now, storage area networks, it's this idea of connecting multiple devices, multiple physical devices or virtual devices together to, to, um, to approximate a, um, a one, whole, um, uh, one whole storage device, okay? Um, so it's, it's sort of like um, having a server farm, Google, when you connect to Google, you, you're probably connecting to one of their thousands if not millions of different servers that they have globally to support all of the different um, requests that they get, you know, every, every minute, right, every second, okay? Um, network and telecommunications. Um, some of the telecommunication services generally for organizations as well as personally, um, you have telecommunication services that provide th uh, two basic types of services, your voice um, services as well as your data or internet connections, okay? Um, and some of the major telecommunications companies include Verizon and AT&T. Um, you have network operating systems. Again, network operating systems, you're looking at server types of systems, systems that, uh, that run server software, um, as well as um, the hardware providers that, that, those, that server software runs on. Okay. Um, for internet platforms, um, your internet platform is all of the different pieces that go together to create uh, to support your websites, your internet, and your extranets. So it's hardware, software, management services, everything to support um, your company website, your e-commerce, um, all of your e-business, anything that you're doing online, as well as those intranets and extranets. Now the difference between those two and intranet is our resources for internal, for the internal stakeholders of a company. Um, so a part of the University of Laverne's intranet would be considered Blackboard, okay? Because Blackboard is not for external users, uh, people outside of the, uh, the university. It's for faculty and for, um, for students to connect and share resources in, uh, you know, in this service that, that we provide here, you know, teaching, okay? Teaching and learning, okay? Um, your hardware, you know, internet hardware, and then of course there's web development tools. And I, the the information in your book is actually more um, up to date than the information on your um, on these slides. Uh, front page is no longer a technology that you use. Microsoft does not um, does not support front page. You can't buy or get front page. Um, Microsoft has a, uh, a web design suite called Expression Web that they, that they support now. Um, so you have d different ways of um, creating web tools as well as websites, okay, which are these tools and suites that are here. And then, of course, consulting and system integration services. Sometimes companies don't have... Oh, most companies, most large companies don't have all of the manpower and the brain power that they need to do everything that they need done. So they have to consult with, they have to get outside consultants to provide some of these services for them. Okay, so things like software integration, putting, bringing new, new systems into your existing infrastructure and making sure that everything plays nice together. Um, which if you have legacy systems, you have older systems, you have different systems all trying to share data, it can be a big job, okay? And of course your legacy systems, like I said before, are those old systems. And when I say old systems, you know, we're not talking 10, 15 years old. We're talking, you know, systems from the 50s and the 60s that have, still have valuable data in them, but it's just too expensive to try to pull out that data and to put it into a, a newer information system. Now some of the trends moving forward for hardware include this mobile platform that we've created and that we find ourselves using, okay? Your smartphones, cell phones, they're, they're doing a lot of the things that, again, that we needed laptops and desktop computers to do, okay? 
Um, we have netbooks. Now, netbooks, are, it was, netbooks seem to be a trend that came and went. <laughs> the very small uh, uh, laptops that um, were you, price point was usually around $300 for this very small lap, laptop, very limited processing and hard drive. And the idea was that you were going to use cloud-based services and other types of services to connect using this small device. Now, tablets have sort of, I, I believe, superseded um, a lot of these netbooks. So you have laptops and you have tablets with a lot of the touch technology. Okay? Um, and then, of course, your networked um, e-readers, things like Kindles, Nooks, stuff like that. Other um, trends include things like grid computing. Grid computing is the use of idle processing time on, a cl on client machines, um, utilizing that processing time and creating a virtual supercomputer to handle very large, complicated data analyses and tasks. Okay. Um, now, grid computing can this idea of grid computing can be utilized um, within an organization, um, but the the idea behind the um, the idea behind grid computing is that for the most part, most of your computers, most of your laptops, your desktops, um, the processing power is underutilized. For any tasks you're giving your your computer. Um, the processor is, is used for only about 25% of the time that you're actually doing any kind of task. Okay, so that's 75%, uh, and that's on average, but that's 75% of uh, processing time that's, that's, being, uh, that's going unused. So if you're able to harness that unused processing time and bring it together with other devices that have that same amount of processing time, of unused processing time, you can create this virtual supercomputer that can handle these large tasks. Okay? Um, virtualization is also another trend that we're seeing. Virtualization, now, um, the best example of virtualization I can give you is Macintosh computers that run Windows and other types of operating systems on them. Okay, um, but virtualization is having a, uh, a a single physical device that can act like multiple virtual devices. Okay, um, and again, this gets back to the fact that most of the time our physical devices are underutilized. Okay, hard drive space that goes unused, processing power that, that is not fully realized. And for companies, instead of purchasing more physical servers, why don't we use the existing servers we have and split up the, the, the hard drive and the processing power in, and have two virtual machines on one physical device. And now we are getting closer to fully utilizing that piece of hardware. Okay, um, it, it, when, when com companies that move toward this, they save in costs and of course they're going to increase the amount of uh, the, the productivity that they're able to get out of these devices. Okay. Now again, cloud computing, um, we see cloud computing, um, which again is this idea of on-demand services using the internet infrastructure. Um, they talk about it as being utility computing, okay? And when you think about utilities, right? Things like um, your electricity, right? Um, residential electricity. When you pay for it, what are you paying for? Service. Right, you're paying for the service. What, what is it? You're, usually your bill fluctuates from one, one month to another. Why is that? Your use fluctuates, right? So you're paying for only what you're using, okay? With cloud computing, this idea of utility computing, you're paying for the computing that you're using. You're not purchasing a whole piece of software um, and and having to maintain that piece of software um, and and you know and just paying that kind of high flat fee. You only pay for the resources that you utilize. So that's where they come in with this idea of utility computing. Okay, and there's three different types of cloud computing. You have infrastructure as a service, which is where customers use processing, storage, networking, and other resources to run on their information systems. 
Okay, so this is where you are basically sort of outsourcing your entire infrastructure um, in the cloud. Okay? Platform as a service. This is where customers um, use infrastructure and programming tools that are hosted by another service to create their own applications. Okay? So here you're actually using storage applications, your whole infrastructure out in the cloud. For platform, you're actually able to use somebody else's resources to create your own applications. Okay? But again, it's still a service that's out in the cloud. Okay? Um, for your software as a service, this is where you're using software that's hosted by a vendor. Okay? That you're, some of the examples for this might be things like Google Apps. Okay? Google has um, a set of, of applications including things like um, email, um, storage, and other types of services that organizations can connect to for a fee and can utilize, right? So instead of hosting your own email server, you put that off on Google. You pay them so that you don't have to worry about making sure that your that piece of hardware is up and running all of the time or that the software is um, is maintained and is um, you know is updated, right? You're paying somebody else to handle all of those issues. Okay? Um, now a cloud could be public or private. Okay, you can have p private clouds that are basically resources in the cloud that are not available to anybody, just people within a particular organization. Um, but it helps for companies to minimize their IT investments because again, they're putting that off on somebody else. I'm paying you so that I don't have to purchase and host and worry about all of the issues, the hardware and the software that comes with that, you know, actually um, hosting our, the, the software itself. I'm paying you so I don't have to worry about that, right? Some of the drawbacks of, of cloud computing, um, there might be some concerns with security, right? While I'm paying you so I don't have to worry about that stuff, I'm also trusting that you're going to be watching out for my data and my information. Right? And if you're using a service, who might, else, who might also be using that same service? Competitor. Your competitors, right? If you find value in that, your competitors are probably going to be too, right? So that might be a concern that you, you, know, that you have. Okay? And then, of course, reliability, because you're putting it off on somebody else, and you are trusting that they're going to have those services up and running when you need them. Okay? Other trends include things like green computing, right? Being aware of where, um, uh, being aware of how um, computers are manufactured, right? What the effect on the environment is in, um, you know, in the way that you dispose of computing devices, right? Um, when you get rid of a monitor or a computer, how do you have to get rid of it? How are you supposed to get rid of it? Anybody know? Can you just throw that away? No. You're supposed to recycle it. There's a lot of very dangerous chemicals that are actually in uh, things like mercury and other chemicals that are in monitors that are in computers that if you throw it away, it goes into the landfill, you're contaminating the landfill. Right? Um, and just in case you didn't know, that's actually what's happening. That's why they, they encourage you to recycle those things. Okay, um, but when it comes to green computing, it's a very large area, so you can also think of not just how they're being manufactured and disposed of, but how much energy they're using, right? A lot more devices, consumer electronic devices have that, have you seen that Energy Star um, uh, uh, requirement? You see it a lot on household devices, things like um, uh, refrigerators and other types of household devices, TVs and other electronics have that energy star. It means that it, it uses a lot more, less energy per year than its, than its, um, its uh, predecessors used to. Okay? Uh, autotomic um, computing is, this, is a solution to the problem that these infrastructures for large organizations are getting more and more complex and much harder to handle much harder to manage. There's a lot of systems, a lot of stuff going on, right? So having, device, having software that can heal itself, having software that can configure itself, um, that can protect itself, 
Okay, so an example of this would be um, self um, self updating software. Okay, uh, it's sort of a simple um, example, right? But your your operating system and your devices that you connect to the internet and it searches for updates and it comes back and tells you you have you have so many updates to 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 do. Um, uh, antivirus software that searches for um, virus definition updates to uh, to make sure that it is protecting your device against the latest viruses and um, and other types of malware. Okay, um, and then of course high performance power saving processes, having uh, a processor with multi uh, with uh, more than one core on it, so that you can, on one on one processor. Okay, so you might have heard of dual core or uh, quad core processors, right? Um, if you haven't heard of that, it's having more than one actual processor on a on a particular chip. Okay, so that you can uh, it you know doubles, triples, or um, uh, quadruples your processing power on that one that one single piece of hardware. Some uh, contemporary software trends. Uh, include things like Linux and open source software, and we've talked a little bit about that, right? Software for the web. Java is a, um, a piece of software that um, can be run on any platform, um, and it's actually, because it can be run on any platform, it's very well suited to the internet, okay? Um, and there's a lot of websites and application, web applications that are developed using Java, um, and a lot of times with Java, when you're using Java, it has to download a small applet to your, um, to your device in order to run uh, the application, okay? Um, Ajax, which is asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, if you've ever had to, um, had to update a particular web page, right, you, you go in, you put, um, you, you update and refresh a page, right? The Ajax um, makes it so that you can update pieces of the web page and not the whole page. So instead of updating all of the pieces that are still static, it's really just the data that's going to change. Okay, so it makes it so that you can load pages faster. Okay. Web services. Um, Web services, these are software components that exchange information using web standards and languages. Um, and all of these different pieces work together to, uh, to provide web services. Um, XML, which is Extensible Markup Language, is actually um, a web language that is more powerful and more flexible than HTML. HTML is the language of the internet, but it's very limited. HTML, you can't create new tags. HTML um, incorporates not just the content, but also the um, formatting. Okay, so if you've looked at a web page, um, there's a lot of formatting um, HTML tags that, that sort of mix the content and the formatting together. XML is just about the data. And you can create tags that, that, tell, that describe the data very accurately. You can create new tags for your uses. Okay, so it's very flexible and it's very uh, data oriented. Okay, your simple ac um, object access uh, protocol or SOAP. These are rules for structuring uh, messages enabling applications to um, uh, pass data and instructions. Okay, so this is a technology that helps in, in creating web services. Um, the WSDL, this is Web Services Description Language. This is a framework for describing the different types of web services and capabilities that are out there. Okay? Um, and UDDI, Universal Description Discovery and Integration, this is a directory for lo locating web services. And all of these different pieces work together to provide web services to um, organizations. Okay? A service-oriented architecture, or an SOA, um, this is um, a set of these self-contained services that communicate with each other to um, create a working software application. Okay, and you can have um, now service-oriented architectures utilize different pieces, basically pieces of code, um, in order to create 
um, working software. Okay. Now the cool thing about service-oriented architectures is that you can reuse those pieces in different applications. Okay. So if you have a process that um, that you have a, a um, you have a piece of code that connects to a particular um, database, right? You can reuse that piece over and over again any place that you would want to be able to connect to that database. Okay, it's reusable. Okay, and they show um, they give you an example of how Dollar Rent a Car uses web services to connect to its outside partners. Okay, uh, Southwest tour operators, travel reservation system, wireless websites, right? They, they use web services to be able to connect to all of these different outside, um, outside partners. Okay? Now with software, um, outsourcing and cloud services, there's three different sources for organizations to get software. Okay? One of those is software packages, basically purchasing software off the, um, off the shelf. Okay, existing software that, um, that meets the needs of a particular industry or a particular type of business. Um, you have software outsourcing, and there's two different types of outsourcing that companies can do. They can do domestic or offshoring. Okay, domestic, um, a lot of times is done, generally done for a lot more um, uh, software creation and higher level software types of tasks, um, uh, consulting, things like that, okay? Um, offshoring, which is when you are um, outsourcing um, to another country. Um, typically, things like um, call center, um, data entry, stuff like that, although there is a trend toward higher level consulting services that are being out offshored also. Um, you can also have cloud-based um, services, right? The software as a service. Um, which again, cloud-based, it's accessed through the internet. Um, and it, um, software as a service can, ha can be free or low-level software or low-cost software that is um, for individuals all the way to enterprise level. Um, software. A lot of times you can pay either as a subscription or by transaction, just depending. Um, Salesforce.com is an example of this type of, of software. Okay? And when, you, when you're creating these connections, um, these, these types of contracts, either software as a service or offshoring, um, offshoring um, outsourcing, right? you have to create something called a service level agreement which is a contractual agreement between the two organizations as to who's going to be um, responsible for what part of the, um, of the, uh, the relationship, okay? Okay, and you can see in this chart over time how the sources of software are changing, right? In the, in the 90s, right, overall, this is overall here, software expenditures, Right? Software as a service, how over time, up until 2000, you have more of your general software expenditures that are going to software as a service um, versus other types of, you know, just purchasing the software and utilizing it, as well as outsourced software. So there's these trends toward utilizing, um, you know, software as a service or outsourcing versus just, you know, creating the software in-house or actually purchasing off the shelf. Um, other types of trends include things like mashup. So mashup is a combination of two different types of data. The most common type of mashup is um, map-based. Google Maps is an example of a mashup where you have a map-based structure where, and you have directory or other type business and other types of information that's overlaid on top of that structure. Okay. Um, apps have become very popular, and apps are small pieces of software that uh, run on mobile platforms, um, generally delivered over the internet, but, um, and it's become easier and easier for, pe for anybody to create an app, really. You, you too could, be, could create the next uh, Angry Birds. Um, now, we, in these infrastructure, with these, these types of infrastructures, you also have management issues that have to be dealt with, okay? Um, now, 
with any type of infrastructure, you always want your systems to be flexible. You want them to be able to be scalable, which means that if there's an increase, if the business expands, the, or the, the information systems should be able to expand and meet the, the increasing needs of the organization. Okay, so when companies are thinking about IT expenditures, they should be thinking about, is this system scalable? In the future, if we expand our operations in the next five or ten years, are we going to have to move from this system to something else because it's not going to be able to handle um, our newer um, our newer size and newer levels of traffic and, and needs? Okay. Um, with mobile and cloud computing, companies are realizing that they're going to, that they're having to incorporate these ty this type of computing into their day to day process into the way they do business, right? Um, having uh, a lot of companies have moved toward having their own applications, having their own little apps that customers and other outside stakeholders can connect using their mobile devices because people want to be able to do that. Okay. With management and governments, there's some questions that companies have to ask. Things like, who controls the infrastructure? Right? Is it your IT department? Is it the different pieces are controlled by different parts of the organization? Right? Um, how should it be organized? Should it be centralized? Are we a company that needs a centralized um, IT type of system, or should it be decentralized? Right? And this, these are the types of questions that people that managers have to ask themselves when they're looking, analyzing their infrastructure and looking at um, adding to or making changes to that infrastructure. Um, you know, what are the costs? How are they allocated between different departments and different parts of the organization? If we, if we decide to, uh, you know, to invest in a system that's going to serve the needs of the entire enterprise. Right? You also have to think about how do we make wise, in, wise decisions when it comes to um, spending our IT budget, right? Do we rent versus buy? Do we... Um, do we use this um, cloud computing versus actually hosting and maintaining the software and the system in-house, right? When you're looking at investing, you have to take this total cost of ownership or TCO type of view. Now, I can compare this to when you decide to, if you own a car, right? When you, when you own a car, you're looking at buying a car, what are some of the costs that you have to take into account? Huh? Gas. Gas. Insurance. Insurance. Maintenance. Maintenance, right? Just because you paid, you know, your ten thousand dollars and you financed and you're you're making payments on the car, that's not where the that's not where it stops, right? It's the same thing with information systems. Just because the price tag says fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, you have to also think about how are we going to maintain this system? How are we going to train our employees to use this system? Um, how are we going, you know, you have to think of the whole picture when you're looking at investing in, in a system, okay? Now you can also look at, when you're thinking about investing in an IT infrastructure, you can also look at this competitive forces model. Now it's not the same, I, I wish they'd used a different name for it because it kind of um, could be easily confused with the five forces model. Um, but that you, when you're looking at and thinking about whether or not to invest in new IT for a particular organization, these are some of the areas that you really need to look at. And there's six different areas. What's the demand for your services, right? Are your customers complaining about slow upload or download times? Are your employees unable to do their job because systems are uh, access to data and systems are slow? Right? Um, what is your business strategy? What's your firm's business strategy? Um, what's your IT strategy, your infrastructure, and your overall cost? And here is where you're going to look at that total cost of ownership model when you're looking at investing in new systems. Okay? Um, you, you need to do an IT assessment of the organization. And you also need to keep track of what, you know, what are your competitors doing? 
Okay, just because your competitors are doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good fit for you. But you also you need to keep track of what they're doing because again, if you fall behind, um, you you can end up you know uh, losing enough market share to end to, you know to end up having to close your doors, and you don't want to do that. Okay. So this looks at those six different uh, factors and how they you know how they connect to your firm's infrastructure. Okay, it's just a visual way of looking.